Hey church, uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be preaching from Luke chapter 4 today, and um, the main talk, the idea for today's uh, sermon is Jesus is the Son of God. We're going to be um, we're working from verse 1 to 14 today. Uh, so far, we have, we have, I hear you guys are going through a series in Luke, and you saw in chapter 1 and 2 about the birth of Jesus and the childhood of Jesus. And in chapter 3, you saw the baptism of Jesus. And over there where the heaven opened up and God declared, Jesus, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And then you see uh, the bottom half of chapter 3, you see the genealogy of Jesus. Uh, and in his earthly form, he's the son of David, um, which the prophets have prophesied that Jesus is going to come through the line of David. And David is the son of, um, all the way goes back to Adam. So you see, uh, the biblical authors are giving you an evidence of who Jesus is, his, his authenticity as him as a person, as a, both as a human and as God. And Luke in chapter 4, he's testing G if Jesus is the God. And, and he's seeing the test, and the test is conducted by the devil himself, the devil's advocate. And in this case, the devil himself is, is the advocate interviewing Jesus. Um, if you are to go into a job or something, you definitely have to go through an interview process. I, the missions agency that I'm going with, um, Mission to the World, they had me tested in my personality with Myers-Briggs, Enneagram, my um, spiritual, spiritual life, my ap biblical aptitude and all of that to test me to see if I can endure this task of being a missionary in India. So um, it's the same thing uh, Jesus is going through at this time, the, uh, and the devil is questioning Jesus if you are really the Son of God. Um, so I, I'm going to read from chapter, uh, in chapter 4, verse 1 to 14. I'm reading from the ESV translation. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and, all, and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, You are the Son of God, throw yourself down. You hear, if, for it is written, if he will command angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, and lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Um, just going to pray a small prayer. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for, this, for your word today. Um, give us an attentive ear to hear your word and speak through me today and be with me as I um, preach your word. In your name, amen. So we saw the opening lines to this chapter. We see Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit from the baptism and now he's uh, through the Spirit, he is led into the wilderness to be tested, to um, and and the devil comes in and he tries to test Jesus. Uh, we have three kinds of temptation here. You see uh, Jesus first being tested. Um, will the, will Jesus be able to turn the bread in, uh, to turn the stone into bread to ch to see if Jesus is humanness, uh, if he's able to satisfy his hunger? And then we see G uh, the devil uh, taken, showing him all the well, all the world to, to check Jesus to, if he would fall for his temptation if, and to see if Jesus is divine, if he's the sovereign God of this world. And then the, finally he shows him, uh, he puts him up on a pinnacle of on, top, on top of a tall place and tells him if you fall, um, God will uh, protect you. Let's see if you are really God, you can protect yourself. That's what he's trying to say. So you see three kinds of temptation and based on that we're going to, um, I'm Today's sermon is going to be based on that. So I have three points for us today. First point is Jesus is the obedient Son of God. And the second one is Jesus is the Holy Son of God. 
And the last one is Jesus is the faithful son of God. So we see the first one, Jesus is the obedient son of God. Um, Jesus was famished from 40 days of fasting. Um, no water, no food. He, he, must, he must have been very hungry. Uh, food is a very prime need for us. Um, we Sometimes when I don't get food, uh, and I don't eat food at the right time, I go into this vulnerable state. I call it the hangry state, hungry and angry at the same time. And that could happen to me, I skip food for an hour, and here Jesus is after 40 days. So this is a very vulnerable time that where Jesus is, and the devil comes up in front of him. Yeah, if you are really the son of God, turn the stone into bread so you can consume it. Uh, hunger is a very basic need for all of us. We need food to sustain us. And, uh, and the devil comes up, if, you are the really God, if you're really God, then you can do this. The devil knows who God is, so he knows what makes who God is. He, uh, we know that God is a transcendent God. Um, we know it's not, he's just not an arbitrary thing out there. He has a personality, and the personality is holiness, and that makes him different. Moses, in Exodus 15, verse 11, he says, Who is like you, O God, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic on holiness, awesome and glorious deeds, doing wonders? The devil wanted to provoke Jesus to use his power to satisfy his own hunger. He wanted to see the flesh part of Jesus, the hum human part of Jesus, if Jesus would use his powers for his own selfish gain. Um, that's what he wanted to test. But Jesus gives him the right answer at the same time. Man shall not live by bread alone, but the word of God. Um, we see in the Old Testament, as they were going through the desert, they were tested as well. They were hungry for food, and then they shouted at God saying, Hey, why do you rescue us from uh, Egypt? We were happy there. Uh, you, we, we would rather prefer to be slaves in Egypt than for us to die here in this desert. What they questioned is, they questioned, what, what deeply was the question was is, they questioned the status of God. They did not trust in his provision, right? And that's what Jesus says, trust in the word of, of God. That is, we know God through his revelation, through his word, and that's how we know him. <clears throat> so when the Israelites disobeyed, reprimanded, but on the other hand, you see Jesus obeying. Jesus is a perfect Israelite. My professors at Covenant would say Jesus is the ideal Israelite, whom Israelites should have been. But Jesus is a fulfillment of that role. In um, Exodus 19, 6, um, Moses says to the Israelites, actually the God says to the Israelites, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The role of Israel was to be a beacon of light to all the nations around them. That's why God had to set up a place and there, Jerusalem was on a mountain above all so they could shine God's glory up to all the nations around them but as we know they failed um, with, uh, with their character with their um, relationship with God in, <clears throat> in Luke 22 uh, we see Jesus uh, the passion passion begins from Luke 22 where we see Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper and in that, Jesus says that I am the bread of life. Here, you see the contrast here, where, where Jesus could have used his power for his own good, but in Luke 22, when we see the crucifixion, Jesus becomes the sacrificial bread for us. Uh, Paul, in 1 Corinthians, he says, Paul, uh, <coughs> that the food should remind us of the re redemption of Eden and, ho and a hopeful glory of God, of creation itself. You see, Jesus' intention to come into this world is not for his own work. He didn't want to have his own agenda for this earth. He rather had an agenda that God had for him, that is to redeem this world. And um, <clears throat> John 10, 18, Jesus says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up this charge I have received from my father. So Jesus was also invested in this mission for redeeming people back to God. So Jesus had a uh, mission to be here on, here on earth, and that is to 
be a perfect sacrifice for us. Unlike Adam, who was supposed to be in relationship with God, he disobeyed God by uh, doing the thing, the very thing that God didn't want him to do. And here we see differently. Uh, we see from King David, he, uh, in the Old Testament, he, there, people of God are trying to be, uh, continue to be sustained by God through, through doing sacrifices. It's a way they did to be in communion with relationship with God. But they realize something in Psalm uh, 51, 16 to 17, he says, Certainly you do not want a sacrifice, or else I would offer it. You do not desire a burnt sacrifice. The sacrifices God desires are a humble spirit, O God, a humble and repentant heart you will not reject. David was convinced that even though as human beings, as good as we are, uh, as God has made us in his image, we still fail to be a, a perfect in the eyes of God. And here we see Jesus being a, per, a humble spirit. He could have turned, he used his own power to turn the stone into bread to satisfy his hunger, but he refuses to do so. Um, <clears throat> we can also see the same pattern of Jesus' obedience here. Um, God, Jesus obeyed God to come into this world. We also see that at the passion, at the very end, he cries, if this, if this is your will, let, let it be. Uh, or let, he, asks, he cries in agony saying, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. But if it's your will, I'll do it. And, uh, and Jesus went through it. He obeyed God even at the most, well, he knew what's going to happen at the agony of the cross. So uh, we see Jesus being an obedient son of God um, here on earth. And the, so the devil finds out, okay, so he's not corrupted in flesh. He's not like every other human being. Now let's test if he is actually a holy God. And so, we, uh, he, so the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. We see Jesus being taken up to a high place, and he's shown at the moment of time all the dominions of the world, probably the world powers, powers of that time, the Roman Empire, and so on. He's shown all the kingdoms, all the, ple all the pleasures that come with it, with it as well. Sa uh, Satan is offering all the kingdoms of this world, but this is a bait, uh, and the trap comes next. I will give all of this to you if you bow down and worship me. And that's what he's asking if you. <clears throat> so there is some truth and an error part to what Satan is saying. Yes, it is true that Satan is part of this world. He influences king kingdoms. He influences people to do his bidding. He tempts people. That's what he does. We're talking about temptation. He tempts people to do his bidding and rebel against God. But the error part is, God is the sovereign of this world. Devil doesn't own this world. He's, he's operating only under the sovereignty of God. We see the allegiance of Jesus to the Father being in question. Um, <clears throat> all the, there's a lot of stuff that's happening right here. It's, um, is Jesus at a vulnerable moment after his fasting? It's, he's at, all you need Jesus had to do is bow down. You see, the devil, uh, Paul notes in 2 Corinthians, the devil parades around as an angel of light. It begs the question, though, does Satan rule over spiritual matters? And that is why Jesus precisely answers from Deuteronomy 6.13, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. There's only one true form of worship, and that is to worship God alone. Jesus was uncompromising to this fact that God alone is the creator of this world and sovereignty belongs only to him. Jesus knows this because he was from the beginning in Colossians 1, 16, 17. For, him, for, him, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him, for him, and he is before all things and in him all things hold together. This whole world was created by God 
And Jesus was there at the very beginning. He knows, and he is God. He knows that all of this belongs to him. And Satan's biggest adversary is Jesus because uh, Satan was successful in um, tempting Adam and Eve, and the fall came into the world. And now Jesus is coming to reverse that. This is, this is, Jesus, uh, this is the devil's greatest adversary is Jesus. And Jesus is coming to bring new life and take away death. So we see um, Jesus being uh, in a vulnerable, vulnerable moment. It's a momentary of time where Jesus could have fallen, but he did not. Jesus took the long route. So Jesus came to re reconcile the world to himself. If he had bowed down and worshipped the devil, then he could have reconciled the world again to him. But it's different. This is not the kind of reconciliation that God want, what Jesus wanted to do. He wanted to reconcile the world not to the devil, but to God the Father. And in Second uh, Corinthians five seventeen to eighteen, we read: Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is a new creation. The old has passed away; behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who, through Jesus Christ, reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is the reason Jesus has come, not for His own agenda or something of His own, but to do the will of the Father, and to and and to reconcile the world to God. We say reconciliation is a prophetic role in um, Israel. Uh, whenever the Israelites walked away from God, God uh, sent a prophet and he told them, this is, this is not what you do, you should come back to God. So we see Jesus playing a prophetic role as well. Christ came into this world to fully reclaim the world back to God, to reverse the fall of Eden and bring in the new creation. We cannot enter God's presence on our own, but... Jesus, our mediator, helps us stand in front of God um, because God is holy and that is not, and everything that's holy is not the same as compared to our common. Um, God's holiness, like in the Old Testament, the priest had to do a, a number of rituals to actually go into the presence of God. And even that, they were at risk. But that, because that's, that's what holiness is. It's light that sharks against darkness. And we, it is hard, for, it, we cannot stand in front of God, but Jesus, as a mediator, he does it. And uh, we, we know um, we can, Jesus is able to do that because Jesus is holy. Jesus is holy. We, we must have gone through this chapter in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. And the angel said to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born, to be born will be called Holy, son, the Son of God. We see in this in this very chapter, the beginning, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit going into uh, the wilderness. Jesus is a holy God. So, uh, we talked about hunger in the previous, po uh, in the previous um, point. Sin, sin is like hunger. The want for more. Think about it. There are three things that lead us uh, to do. The, there are three motives that are out there that, would that we consider all sins is based on. That's power, money, and sex. That's the that's the modern world, the way we see the world, and um, we 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 search for it. We are hungry because we're discontent with what we have. So, with you, the need to control more it leads you to hunger for more power. The need to attain everything and gain everything leads you to the power of uh, searching for money. The need to satisfy all de sexual desires lead us into committing adultery. So we, we are all hungry all the time. It's like a well. When we dig in, we try to think we found gold, but we didn't. It's not there. We, it's not enough. We want more. We keep digging. We dig, keep digging harder and, and deeper and deeper. Uh, Carl Jung, he says that no, uh, about human beings, uh, no tree it is said to can grow to heaven unless its roots reaches down to hell. It's a quest for happiness, a quest for an earthly heaven that we want, that we dig deeper, and it's a hunger that we cannot satisfy. Jesus, in this temptation from the devil, is shown the whole world, dominion, power to rule. Instead, Jesus chooses to sacrifice himself to do the will of the Father. This is what Jesus is calling us to. When you start digging into the world and uh, trying to go, going into the quest for gaining the whole world, instead, Jesus says, sacrifice it because it is not it is not what it is 
that's not where you find joy and contentment. But that's hard, right? Like, how can I give up my desires to pursue a godly life or godly living? How do I know that my unfulfilled desires would ever be content? Would it be ever satisfied? Um, we can talk about that in the next point. The next point is uh, Jesus is the faithful son of God. Well, when I was a young new Christian, I always sometimes wondered why Jesus never um, called himself a real king, you know? Uh, you see, when he did in John 6, chapter 6, verse 15, the people went after Jesus after he did some miracle, and they said, do you can make him a king? But Jesus withdrew from them, and he didn't want to become a king. And there's other places where the evil spirits, uh, where Jesus trying to uh, drive away demon-possessed people, and the evil spirits said, Jesus, that's Jesus, the Son of God, right there. And I was like, why didn't the people hear that? Did the people hear that, that Jesus is the Son of God? Can't they just obey directly right there? I always wonder why Jesus didn't do, um, take up the mantle right then, right there. So we read the next uh, temptation. Jesus was made to stand at a high point at the temple. It's a pinnacle. It's the place where if you fall, you might get hurt bad, uh, badly. So Satan says when he puts him up, up in this high place, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. The devil wanted Jesus to do a superman. He just wanted Jesus to fall and he wanted him to fly in front, in front of the people, in front of the temple. We all watch comic books. We all see what it is. Um, we know superhero movies because we like them because it's something that's not ordinary. It's extraordinary. Something that's not part of a real, real world. And we would, and it captivates us and we are drawn towards it. Um, and here in this place, we see devil uh, looking for that same opportunity. He takes him to the temple in ancient Israel. And at the temple, that's where God resides. He feels that that's where God's, um, he, he feels that Jesus would feel comfortable that uh, God would help him out here. In Psalm 91, 11 to 12, here again, uh, that's what the Satan's quoting from Psalm 91, that God will protect the righteous. If you are really righteous and good, um, just fall. God will protect you. In, in today's world, we also see some questions like this asked all the time. If miracles, if Christianity is true, there's miracles out there, show me. If God is true, show me where God is. I will see. If I see, I will believe. We, we, they are. People ask these questions all the time. But Jesus refuses for the same reason, that it's an artificially created situation. It's an unbelief in God and masquerading in faith. Um, Origen, an early church um, um, father, he said, whenever someone is quoting scripture, be careful of trusting the speaker immediately. Consider the person, what sort of a life the person leads what sort of opinions he holds, what sort of attention he has. Otherwise, he might pretend that he's holy and not be holy. Uh, the devil precisely uses the scriptures to ask Jesus if he is the son of God, Paul, and God will protect him. And, and Jesus replies from Deuteronomy 6.16, It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That uh, The temptation in the de wilderness is once again a reminder of what's happening right here. They, people demanded God for their protection. They said, if you are really God, protect us from our hunger and protect us from, all, from our infirmities. It is not a place of loyalty. It's not a place of faith. But it, is a, it, is, it comes from sin, not something that's good. Not, it, it doesn't come from righteousness. <clears throat> Jesus doesn't want a... Jesus didn't want to do a superman because he didn't want people to believe him out of fear. Jesus is not just some powerful being. He Jesus is a person that he wants us to really love. And that's the difference that the devil didn't get. In Colossians 1.22, Jesus, um, Paul says, He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before God. It's, it's an humble character of Jesus that he died on the cross so he can reconcile each one of us and pre present us blameless. 
That is the goal. It is a personal transformation within us, so we would want to seek God out of an earnest loving towards our Father. Uh, today we see we have the sacraments. The Lord's Supper is a way where we have an external means where we can physically participate in God's kingdom. It opens up. The sacrament is a way of um, ad an administrative status in front of God. So where Jesus is, is the mediator. The bread that we consume in the Lord's Supper is, the, is our um, satisfaction for a hunger that we have and we are seeking. And the wine that we have that is the new covenant it's a remembrance of a new covenant that God made uh, so it reads in Ezekiel 36 I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you an, uh, and I will remove a heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh <clears throat> and I will put my spirit within you cause you to walk in my status and be careful to obey my rules the hunger for sin is satisfied on the cross, and through Jesus' resurrection, we have a new life and a new desire to live. A hunger is satisfied on the cross. Paul Tripp, a pastor in Philadelphia, in his book, New Morning Mercies, he writes, So we look to creation for life, hope, peace, rest, contentment, identity, meaning, purpose, inner life, and motivation to continue. The problem is that nothing in creation can give you these things. Creation was never designed to satisfy your heart. Creation was made to be one big finger pointing you to the one who alone has the ability to satisfy your heart. Many people will get up today and in some way will ask creation to be their savior, that is to give them what only God is able to give. The hunger for happiness is not rooted in creation, but the creator of this entire creation. Man will say, come here, go there to gain happiness and contentment, but Jesus died for you, so you are free from the slavery of hunger, and that is sin. Jesus is a king. Jesus is playing a, a kingly role to protect us. When he reconciled us as a prophet, he's also, he promises that he will protect you as his children. Um, we see that in the Great Commission. Uh, Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I will be teaching them of, your, of my, and my commands. And I will be with you till the end of the age. Jesus promises that he will be with us till the end of the age. And it's a promise of protection that he's there. He's faithful enough that he, he's faithful to the Father and he's faithful to us as well. So today's sermon, we saw the interview of Jesus. And we find Jesus satisfying all the requirements to be the Son of God. All the questions were asked by the devil and he answered them perfectly. Uh, we saw Jesus as a priest interceding for us. He's the bread that he became a bread for us. And he was, he was a perfect sacrifice that he had gave for us. So he, and he presents us in front of the Father. Jesus is a prophet. He reconciles the world to himself and brings them to God. And then as a king, he protects us and he sustains us throughout. These are the three offices of the church. Um, the prophet, priest, and the king that Jesus holds as the head of the church. And I hear next week you guys are going to have a, an ordaining of your elders as well. And some of you are going to be priests. And some of you are going to be taking the role of a prophet. Some of you are taking the role of a king. And challenges are going to be there. Um, this morning, as I was getting ready to come here, I looked at my car and I was like, oh, that's a flat tire. You see, that's, that's what the devil does to prevent you from doing God's work. And God says, I will protect you and, do, and I will be with you. You can trust in Jesus because he's the son of God Almighty. Amen. Thank you, David, for bringing us a message from Luke chapter 4. Just as Jesus so faithfully uh, served us and came through and gave his own life, not not taking the short route, but going through and doing the long route, doing the hard work that God put before him rather than the short and easy one that the devil tempted him with. So we now can celebrate the fruit and the, the product of what Jesus did. And we do that at the table. We do that because just as Jesus is the bread of life, so he brings together the people from all nations, from all tribes, from all cultures. Just as the bread and the grain is brought from many fields into one loaf, so we are brought into one body. Just as 
The grapes are brought from many vineyards and many vines into to one wine, one cup. So we are brought from many places to be molded, to be uh, used, and to be developed by Jesus into a people worthy of serving him and of flourishing and expanding his kingdom. So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus, taking the bread after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Because there is nothing else in creation that will satisfy like Jesus will. In the same manner, after they had supped, he took the cup and he poured it out, saying, this is my blood, poured out as a new covenant on your behalf. Take and drink, and as often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. For those of you who are here, you'll have the cups there at your seat. There's two flaps there, one to release the wafer, one for the grape juice. Uh, if you're at home, I invite you to uh, join us with whatever and bread, maybe grape juice or wine or whatever other things you may have. But the table is ready, Christ Church. Let us eat, let us drink at the table with God.